Welcome to the Headspace Podcast, where we attempt to make sense of our never-ending existential crisis through the lens of artistic expression. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. No, we made you come on. Let's do it! What is going on, guys? Welcome back to the Headspace Podcast. I am your host, Xavier Reichbaum, founder of Headspace Productions. If you haven't heard last week's episode of the podcast, that was episode 5, and I covered David Fincher's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. There is an argument to be made that it was my most vulnerable episode yet, and it was actually very, very cathartic for me to open up about a lot of the experiences that I opened up about in that episode. Um, There is definitely a trigger warning necessary for it, and the episode does start off with a trigger warning. Um, That episode contains discussions of certain subjects that may be triggering for some, uh, hence the the title of Trigger Warning. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I made sure to put it in the beginning of that episode because, damn, that, that episode got pretty deep and pretty dark, Um, but that's also one of my favorite movies of all time, and I was so happy to finally discuss it in depth on my channel in some way, because I, while while I have talked about the film briefly before through that medium, I never got the opportunity to really discuss it in depth the way I wanted to, and so I was very happy to finally be able to do that episode, so please do check it out if you find the time. But in today's episode of the Headspace Podcast, we're going to be talking about a film that is potentially very easy to write off for a lot of people, just given the mass amounts of commercial and critical success and acclaim and recognition at the 2017 Academy Awards. But I'm someone who's always been of the position that the artists behind the project don't really have much control over that and aren't really to blame for that. Like, obviously, they're going to do their Oscar campaigns and all that stuff because the recognition is nice and and it's cool to set goals for yourself like that. But the true value and the true quality of a piece of art should not be judged, I feel, by the amount of acclaim it receives. I, I think it's highly situational and should be judged on a case-by-case basis, uh, purely depending on the um, individual experiences of everybody who experienced the film. And I know for me, the film we're talking about today, I I have a a very personal um, connection to it, just purely on on an artistic level as an artist myself, and we're definitely going to be having some of those discussions today. It's funny, because I was actually considering doing this film as episode one of this podcast. I wanted it to be the pilot episode, and then I decided that the pilot episode of the podcast, we shouldn't be talking about one specific piece of art, even though I kind of did, because I wanted the point of the first episode, um, which was basically introducing this whole idea for the podcast, to be talking about where the idea came from, where the term headspace came from for me, Um, and why I use it in pretty much everything I do, why I named my production company Headspace Productions, why this is called the Headspace Podcast, and really why the word Headspace is just such a massive part of my identity and and, and why it works itself into everything I do and why naturally the name Headspace is going to be attached to any product that I produce just given the fact that my company is called Headspace Productions. That's what I decided I wanted the first episode to be about. So I was like, okay, so episode two will technically be the first episode of the podcast that really exercises the, or I guess realizes the potential of the show with discussing a specific piece of art. And I wanted to talk about La La Land. I wanted that to be the first film that I talked about on the podcast because it just seemed very natural and appropriate, just given the point of the show. Um, but I eventually decided against it because it just felt like such a daunting task to undergo because what can I say about this film that I haven't all that, that I personally haven't already said and that every single other person who has analyzed this movie and poured all their blood, sweat and tears into 
doing video essays on the film also hasn't already said. And then eventually, I was just like, fuck it, this movie means everything to me. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. For a while there, it actually was my favorite movie of all time. And I would say that it's potentially still my second favorite movie of all time. The, the film that dethroned it is actually David Lowry's A Ghost Story, which I will also absolutely do an episode about, but that's one I'm definitely procrastinating on because... God damn. I, I mean, there's so many movies that mean a lot to me, like the one we're talking about today, for example, but that film means something to me on a much deeper level than really any other piece of art or even real life experience that I've ever gone through. That movie helped me heal from so much and um, definitely going to do an episode about it one day, but I kind of want to experience a lot more of my life before... I do an episode on that, so we're going to be waiting a while on that one. But yes, as you already know, today we are discussing the film La La Land, which was released in 2016. It was written and directed by Damien Chazelle, and it was his third feature film. I think a lot of people falsely think that this is his second feature film after Whiplash, and a lot of people wrongly assume that Whiplash was his feature directorial debut, but his actual feature directorial debut was for a film called Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench in 2009. I believe I got that title right. I apologize, apologize if I didn't, but that actually was his first feature film. And then Whiplash is the one that like really skyrocketed him, sky, skyrocketed him uh, to the, the A-list of directors in Hollywood. And then he got to make La La Land after that as a result, as La La Land was his true dream project for a very long time, as I understand it. So this film is his follow-up to Whiplash, and it stars Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. So my initial experience with this film actually occurred in 2019. I was with my family. We were just sitting in our living room looking for something to watch, and uh, we found La La Land, and a lot of us were very interested in seeing it because of all the acclaim and how much we had heard about it. And um, this was also sort of the perfect time in my life to have an initial experience with this film because this was the, the year of my life where I started to develop an equal amount of passion for theater and musicals and that whole artistic medium. Um, an equal amount of passion for that stuff as I had already developed uh, for film. So th this film is honestly quintessential to so much of what I love and what I pursue uh, when it comes to artistic expression and why I love it so much. It played a very major role in solidifying my stance that this was going to be what I did for the rest of my life. It had a significant emotional impact on me, and I do think some of that is because at that point in my life, sure, I had seen a bunch of very harrowing, very hard-hitting films, but i never seen a film that I could relate to on such a personal level, maybe not when it comes to the actual literal like physical events happening in the movie, but when it comes to the sentiment of the film and this pursuit of artistic expression and just, God, it just meant so much to me at that point in my life. And, and you know, when I say I had already experienced so many hard-hitting films, like at that point in my life, yes, I had seen... Films like Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan and, you know, all these super, like, devastating movies. But obviously, those are movies that are presented in a way where, obviously, it's going to be very emotionally impactful as I watch them. But also, obviously, they are not movies that I could relate to on a personal level in regards to, like, I yes, I have experienced those emotions before. I have, like, maybe general emotions but when it comes to actual, like, circumstances, I, I guess just the overall sentiments of the film. Um, it was never something that really connected with me um, because I, at that point in my life, as I said, I hadn't seen a lot of movies that really explored it in the way that La La Land did. And so, as I said, this film was very quintessential. It, it was a very, um, I, I would definitely label it as a milestone in my growth as someone pursuing a career of artistic expression. 
And since then, as I said, it has become one of my favorite films, and I continue to defend it because so many people are so quick to label the film overhyped or overrated. But as I said at the towards the beginning of the episode, I, I don't feel like that's fair criticism. I, I do think it's fair criticism to say that the film is um, over hyped. I, I think it's fair to say that the film is overhyped, sure, because that doesn't um, necessarily directly imply that you're blaming the artists for it. But I also think people conflate the terms overhyped and overrated a lot. And so it's kind of a slippery slope whenever we're um, having those debates. But I have always been a very fierce defender of this movie. And proudly so. I continue to defend it to this day. And despite all the critical and commercial success and how much it was rubbed in everybody's faces, I don't think it takes away from the quality of the film at all. It's sort of I sort of have a, a similar stance on music where a lot of people were, will say like, oh, I hate that song. It's so overplayed. And I'm like, OK, a, the, the amount of times a song is played I don't personally feel speaks to the quality of the song isolated to itself. See, see, I don't listen to live radio, and whenever I'm out in public, I'm I'm just listening to my own stuff um, on my my headphones, which are noise canceling and basically cancel out, or I guess tune out everything else around me. So it's not like I'm having songs bashed into my skull through like speakers in stores and and public spaces like that. And so I've never really been able to relate to the sentiment of growing not so fond of a song because I've heard it played so much. Hello by Adele is always the example I go for because, yes, when you look at the the stats, that song was extremely overplayed, but I'm not someone who really, like, experienced that firsthand because most of my music consumption just consists of, by my own free will going on Apple Music or Spotify and just seeing what's at the top of the charts and choosing to listen to whatever I want to listen to however many times I want so that I don't uh, get tired of it. And even when I've overplayed songs for myself, I still don't see it as taking away from the quality of the song. This is a very long and some may say unnecessary rant. Um, for this episode, but it is something that I feel very strongly about, and so I, I just really want to flesh out my perspective on that a lot, and hopefully um, that uh, did so. But a very big thing with this movie for me is that as I've grown, I have found myself relating to it much more over time and finding much deeper meaning in it than I did on my initial viewing. As I said, I first saw it in 2019. I was a freshman in high school, And um, even the fact that it impacted me that much at that age uh, is pretty unprecedented. But since then, having completed high school, almost having completed a full year of college, I, upon rewatch, really do relate to this movie so much more than I did back then, which, again, is fairly unprecedented considering how much it impacted me back then. I I couldn't have imagined that the film would have become more impactful because I didn't think it could be more impactful than it was on initial viewing. But upon rewatches, like like subsequent subsequent rewatches over the years, it really has fulfilled that expectation um, or I guess lack of an expectation over time. And as I've gotten older and experienced um, so many other things, which is why I'm so very excited to talk about it today. So we are going to get into the um, full recap of the film. And as you guys know, um, I don't do like as meticulous of a recap as I did with the first few episodes because I want to get these episodes out to you and uh, in as timely of a manner as I can. And so I sort of had to forfeit the literally talking about each and every frame of the film approach. Um, it also allows each episode's duration to be more of each episode's duration to be dedicated to the actual point of the show. So we're going to go ahead and get into the overall recap of the film, as I naturally assume that everybody listening to this, or at least the majority of people listening to this, have already seen the film. So let me stop wasting your time and, and let's get into it. Let's go on this journey together. 
On a crowded Los Angeles highway, Mia, an on-studio barista and aspiring actress, has a moment of road rage with Sebastian, a struggling jazz pianist. Her subsequent audition goes poorly despite her efforts. That night, Mia's roommates take her to a lavish party in the Hollywood Hills to cheer her up. She has to take a long walk back after finding that her car has been towed. During a gig at a restaurant, Sebastian slips into a passionate jazz improvisation despite warnings from the owner to only play songs on the set list. Mia overhears the music as she passes by. Moved, she enters, but Sebastian is promptly fired for his disobedience. As he storms out, Mia attempts to compliment him, but he coldly brushes her off. Months later, Mia runs into Sebastian at a party where he plays in a 1980s pop cover band. She teases him. After the gig, the two walk together to find their cars, lamenting being in each other's company, despite the chemistry between them. Mia takes Sebastian on a walk around the movie lot, explaining her passion for acting. Sebastian takes Mia to a jazz club, describing his passion for jazz and desire to open his own jazz club. Through these interactions, the two end up warming up to each other quite a bit. Sebastian invites Mia to a screening of Rebel Without a Cause, which Mia accepts, forgetting an earlier commitment with her current boyfriend. Discontented with that date, she leaves and rushes to the theater, finding Sebastian as the film begins. The two conclude their evening with a romantic dance at the Griffith Observatory. After more failed auditions, Mia decides at Sebastian's suggestion to write a personal single actress play, a one-woman show per se. Sebastian begins to perform regularly at the jazz club and the two move in together. A high school classmate, Keith, invites Sebastian to be the keyboardist in his jazz band, which offers a steady source of income. Sebastian is dismayed over the band's pop-oriented style, but decides to sign with them after overhearing Mia trying to convince her mother that Sebastian is working on his career. Mia attends one of their concerts, but is disturbed knowing Sebastian could not possibly enjoy the music that he is devoting his life to. During the band's first tour, Mia confronts Sebastian over his future and goals. Sebastian responds by claiming a steady career is what she wanted for him before accusing her of liking him more when he was unsuccessful because it made her feel better about herself. Insulted, Mia leaves. On the night of Mia's play, Sebastian fails to show up due to a photo shoot he had forgotten about. Only a few people attend, and Mia overhears dismissive comments. Despondent, she decides to move back home to Boulder City, Nevada. One day, Sebastian receives a call from a casting director who had attended Mia's play, inviting Mia to a film audition the following evening. Sebastian drives all the way to Boulder City from L.A. and persuades Mia to attend. For the audition, Mia is simply asked to tell a story. She begins to sing about her aunt who inspired her to pursue acting. Sebastian, confident that the audition was a success, asserts that Mia must devote herself wholeheartedly to the opportunity. They profess they will always love each other, but are uncertain of their future. Five years later, Mia is a famous actress and happily married to another man, with whom she has a daughter. One night, the couple stumbles upon a jazz bar noticing the Sebs logo she had once designed for Sebastian. Mia realizes Sebastian has finally opened his club. Sebastian spots Mia in the crowd. He begins to play their love theme on the piano, prompting an extended dream sequence in which the two imagine what might have been had their relationship worked perfectly. The song ends and Mia leaves with her husband. Before exiting, her and Sebastian share one last look with each other, smiling and Sebastian nodding as Mia leaves the jazz club and the two go on with their lives in separate directions. Whew, I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. I had a very, very hard time not getting emotional um, over the course of that reading of, of the overall events of the film. And it almost feels like a disservice to to only summarize the major events of the movie because it's a very lengthy film that covers so much of these characters' lives and so much of their relationship. And there's so, so much nuance to it. And um, I don't know, just reading that really brought back a lot of emotions that I felt uh, on my first viewing of the film. And just 
so much of of what resonates with me about the movie as a whole. Firstly, um, I forgot to mention this, so just sort of as a correction, I mean, I don't really feel like it's necessary. I feel like most people know this about the film, but yes, it is a musical, and the musical numbers are absolutely fantastic. They are beautifully shot, performed, and choreographed and produced. I love every single song on the soundtrack, even now recording this. I am listening to a um, a 10-hour loop of um, the more melancholic and um, existential pieces present within the film as I record this because it really helps me uh, stay in that headspace um, for the episode and I think um, prompts me to provide much more nuanced or I guess more genuine and emotional commentary. It just does a very good job at keeping me in, in the right headspace for the show. So I guess the first theme I really want to touch on with this would be the dreams and aspirations present within the film and what the film has to say about them. One of the central themes of the film is is the pursuit of dreams and aspirations. Both Mia and Sebastian have passionate dreams that they are striving to achieve. Mia's desire to become a successful actress and Sebastian's ambition to open a traditional jazz club. The film highlights the, I I guess, the sacrifices and the struggles and moments of triumph even that come with pursuing one's dreams, portraying the journey as both rewarding and challenging. And here's the thing, while this film may not be the most realistic in a literal sense portrayal of what it's like to be a struggling artist, I do think on an emotional and on an an existential level. This is probably the most genuine and authentic exploration of that experience that I have ever seen. I think we all know as artists that the journey and the pursuit of a career of artistic expression when you're somebody who just loves the expression side of it more than anything else One of the biggest struggles of that is the amount of sacrifices that you have to make, the amount of people that you're going to encounter that simply don't understand and are more so in it for the material and the monetary gain of it rather than the the emotional catharsis of many artistic experiences. And this can result in you just naturally drifting away from so many people because if any of you guys are really feeling me on this, it is, it's the core of our being. We really don't know what else to do with ourselves. We don't know how else to live our lives. And some may see that uh, (laughs) as a detriment or as a bad thing. But I personally see it as such a beautiful, beautiful thing that is very intriguing on, on a psychological level, but that that's for another episode. <laughs> We're going to get into this a little later when we talk about what the film has to say on the passage of time as an artist and when it comes to pursuing artistic expression as a career. But what I will say now, because it does touch on this theme as well when it comes to sacrifices we make, is that yes, as you get older, you are gradually going to start taking this passion of yours more and more seriously and that can and most likely will and and in fact I would say undeniably will result in drifting away from people and having to let people go and in the case of this movie may result in the end of a very meaningful life-changing relationship that is always going to stick with you no no matter what And that brings us into the themes of love and romance within the film. Love is very intricately, I would say, woven into the fabric of this film. It it drives the emotional journey of both the protagonists almost entirely. Mia and Sebastian's romance is depicted as both magical and tumultuous, filled with moments of joy, passion, and heartbreak. Their relationship serves effectively, I would say, as a backdrop to the larger themes of the film, exploring how love can inspire, motivate, and ultimately shape the paths that 
we choose to follow. As I've talked about before on this podcast, I am currently in a very, very happy, healthy, and honestly euphoric um, long-term committed relationship with the most wonderful, wonderful, sorry, um, partner that I could have ever asked for. He is everything that I've ever dreamed of having and getting to experience with a partner. I mean, the story of how our relationship started sounds like it's completely made up. It sounds like a scene right out of a cheesy, like, 80s teen romance film. But I also want to talk about a romantic experience that I had prior, honestly, almost just prior to when my current relationship started that really shaped me as a person and has played a major role in my growth as not only a person, but as an artist as well. If you guys have seen my review for the film Past Lives, you know that I very vaguely um, touched on this experience in that video um, because that movie just really brought a lot of those memories back and honestly helped me officially on a surface level heal from this experience that I never thought I would heal from because it was quite a painful one and as per the premise of the podcast I'm going to give you guys um, much more detail here so let's get into it. So basically for my freshman year of high school I was going to Enterprise High School in Enterprise, Alabama and this was the year where I kind of started to experience what I thought being a teenager was supposed to be like, you know, going to homecoming. And I also joined the high school theater department there. It allowed me to make some some really good friends that I have since drifted away from j just sort of naturally. There's no hard feelings between anyone. It was just, you know, as we're going to get into, there was distance involved and people just sort of naturally drift apart, go separate ways and things like that. But looking back, it was a very formative year for me. My first semester of my freshman year was at the very, very end of 2019. And we all know what started at the very, very end of 2019. That, of course, was the COVID-19 pandemic. And so my second semester of my freshman year was the start of 2020. And obviously that was very formative in a lot of ways, uh, given the fact that pretty much my entire high school career was in the midst of this global pandemic. But that's a whole other tangent. Basically, I was living with my dad at the time, and given, like, he, he retired from the Army. He had been in the Army for 20 years, and he was offered a, a job in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, so we ended up moving from Enterprise to Ocean Springs, Mississippi, where I started, or I guess where I spent the entirety of my sophomore year of high school and where I joined the Ocean Springs High School Theater Department, which would become my entire life um, in, in the years to come. I've had a lot of very low points in my life, but my sophomore year ha was definitely one of the lowest. In fact, my my entire, the, like the entire duration of my time at Ocean Springs was simultaneously the best portion of my life and also the worst. Because with every great experience that comes with life, there comes just as many bad experiences. Uh, and as depressing of a philosophy as that may be, you can't have the good without the bad. The good would not be so good if there wasn't bad there to sort of even it out. You know, these happy moments that we experience wouldn't feel so happy if we didn't know what it was like to feel the opposite emotions. Joining this theater department my sophomore year was truly an eye-opener and sort of a wake-up call for me where I officially determined that, yes, I not only was I as equally passionate about 
theater as I was film, but I wanted to equally pursue theater as I am pursuing film, which I am continuing to do to this day. The legacy of that department truly cannot be understated here. It's where I forged my first true, um, genuine, like fully authentic, um, close friendships that at the time, you know, some of them I... I thought we're going to be lifelong. So some of them are still intact, but, you know, things happen and uh, people drift apart. Essentially, things in the home were not going so well. As I said, things, th th this was one of the darker periods of my life for sure. And it resulted in me deciding to move in with my mom in Troy, Alabama, uh, which is where she was located at this point where I attended Charles Henderson High School in Troy, Alabama, and I joined the theater department there. Um, and, and I should also know, in my sophomore year at Ocean Springs, when I joined that theater department, that's where I had my first lead role in a show. I played the role of the civil defense warden in the hilarious dark comedy and satire, uh, The Perfect Ending. It, it was a ton of fun. Um, really also solidified that I enjoyed being on stage as much as I enjoyed being behind the scenes of theater productions off stage, uh, to put it shortly. But yeah, because things were getting bad at home, I decided to move in with my mom in Troy, Alabama, where I joined that theater department and played the role of Banquo in a production of Macbeth. Uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, which is th there's no need for me to specify that. We all know what Macbeth is, but that was also a ton of fun. And I also had a lot of very teenage experiences there. Um, I'll, I'll just put it that way. I, I kind of, I know my parents listen to this, this podcast from time to time. So I kind of want to be, I mean, I can talk about whatever I want and it's in the past now, but you know, th there are certain things that I, you know, it's, uh, it's not too much of the point of the episode, and I don't really just want to say it just for the sake of saying it. Maybe in a future episode we'll get into it. In fact, I'm sure we will. But essentially, things weren't so great with home there, and I was really starting to miss the relationships that I had built in Ocean Springs. So I ended up only spending one semester um, at Charles Henderson High School, which was the first semester of my junior year. So I moved back to Ocean Springs and did the second semester of my junior year. And when I got back to Ocean Springs at the start of the second semester of my junior year of high school, I was in a very, very dark place. I had almost no hope left. Um, I, I didn't put a trigger warning at the beginning of this episode, so I'm not going to get too detailed here, but I was heavily considering um, giving up. I'm just going to put it that way. I talk more about those struggles in my episode on The Whale, which was episode two of the podcast, I believe. And that's when I, you know, obviously I, I rejoined the Ocean Springs Theater Department and the director there was very happy uh, to see me return uh, because me and him built a, a really cool um, director, actor relationship in my first year there and especially upon my return he was like super excited that I was back and we were excited to work together again and uh, the reason I point out that I was su that I was at such a dark point in my life is because also upon my return I met someone I was in one of the upper theater classes at this point since it was my junior year and so I got to really meet everybody in this in this department, particularly a lot of the people involved in the competition theater um, side of the department. That wasn't just one of the school productions or one of the intro to theater or theater two productions. Um, this was theater three, I believe. So so it was the upper classes of the theater department where things are you know, much, uh, <laughs> no shade to theater two shows. All the shows that that department produces are honestly fucking incredible. Um, really, truly, truly amazing. Um, very unexpected for a theater department in Southern Mississippi. Definitely. But you know, as you climb the ladder of success in that department, it gets progressively more serious and more demanding. And with that, um, more artistically, fulfilling. But anyway, when I got there, I met someone 
it was a guy. And let's just say that a lot of my quote unquote teenage experiences at Charles Henderson, again, I don't know how much detail I want to get into. Let's just say that I was in a place where I was nervous, not even just to be in an openly a gay relationship, but to just openly express my feelings for, for guys in general. And when I got here, when I got back to Ocean Springs in second semester of my junior year, I met someone and, um, he, I was just completely awestruck. The, 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 the first from the moment, and this sounds so fucking cheesy, but truly from the moment I, I saw him, I just, was completely taken away. And he did a lot for me in that regard because as I said, I was at a very dark period of my life. So I very quickly started developing feelings for this person and I I was nervous about it, but I had a very, very supportive group of friends. And also it was a high school theater department, you know, like 80% of the people in there are fucking gay anyway. So um, I didn't really have much to worry about in regards to like my my general circle uh, having any issues with it for sure. Um, And then in March of that year, which would have been March of 2022, I finally mustered up the courage to confess to him. And I did. And it went well. He was like, yeah, yeah, we can be closer. You know, here's my number. Let's talk. I like you too. Like like that kind of stuff. And so we started talking. And this was insane to me. It was the first time that I had like truly fallen for someone and mustered up the courage to confess to them in person. I made it a point to do it in person. And that sort of has a, a nice little um, bittersweet arc. Uh when when we get to how this ended, because yeah, spoilers, yeah, obviously it ended. But that month or so there, what was truly euphoric for me, just the the idea that like I confessed to someone and it was kind of working out and we were, you know, sparingly spending time together, but still spending time together. Really, um, not much outside of school. In fact, we only really spent time together just one on one, like one time significantly outside of school. Um, but those, those days and and those times truly still some of the best memories of my life. I still hold them very dear to me and, uh, I, I wouldn't change a thing. I truly wouldn't because it showed me that I was actually capable of feeling those things. And it played a huge role in building my confidence and, and security within myself to be in an openly gay relationship. And so in those ways, it did have a very positive impact on me. And in the long run, I would say it definitely did more good than bad for me. But essentially, fast forward about a month, I confessed to him on on March 16th of 2022. And then just over a month later, on April 20th, yes, it was on 420, uh, which I made a joke about to him. Um, On April 20th, he confessed to me in the opposite direction where he was like, hey, look, you're a really great guy and I do love you, but like just not not in that way. I, I don't have romantic feelings for you. You know, I, I think you're a good person. I think you're like totally awesome, but I, I just don't feel that connection. And he made it a point to tell me this in person, which w- honestly, like if if I was going to be broken up with, this what this is the most ideal way to be broken up with. There are, are no hard feelings. There was no toxic aspect of it whatsoever. It was genuinely just the most pure way he could have gone about it. And so I, I don't want to make him out to be a bad guy at all. There are no bad guys in this situation. It was just, I mean, it's part of the reason why it's so bittersweet is because nobody did anything wrong. It just wasn't meant to be. You know, call it right person, wrong time. Call it, you know, right time, wrong person. However you want to twist it. But please understand, there was nothing bad that happened uh, about the situation when it, like, on an individual basis. It just, the, the feelings were not reciprocated, and that's okay. It just wasn't meant to be. And I think that's part of the reason why it was even more heartbreaking for me. I blamed myself for the longest time. And I'll be honest, those those first few weeks uh, after after he um I, see I I hesitate to say broke up with me 
because were we ever like officially dating who knows um <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say broke up with me just for the sake of like convenience like it, it's just you know I don't want to say like I, I don't want to say like after he let me down because that makes him out to be the bad guy which I don't want to do because he's not and he wasn't objectively speaking um so I am going to say like broke up with me um those first few weeks after he ended things um genuinely some of the most gut-wrenching experiences of my life I (sighs) he just he helped me out of such a dark time in my life and so for it to end kind of sent me back into that and and none of that is on him he can't help what he feels he can't help what he felt as neither could I so it was really hard and it was genuinely the experience that made me think I am never doing this again. Fuck love. I'm done with love. Never dating again. Don't want to be in any part of it. Don't want to be involved in it. I just want to live my life, make my art, and that'll be it. So subsequently, I just continued to do my things. You know, I continued to be to to star in shows and, and work on shows in that theater department. I made my first major short film, Monotony. Um, which I guess in some ways was inspired by that experience, but even more so, I made a short film before Monotony that was much like smaller scale called Numb, which is actually still publicly available on my YouTube channel, and in my opinion, visually speaking, the, the best thing that I've ever made. That short film and the final scene of Monotony are like the, the two things that I've made in regards to film that are the things that I'm definitely most proud of. And Numb is publicly available on my YouTube channel if you guys want to check it out. And I don't know if this guy that I've been talking about knows this. And hey, if you're listening to this episode, sorry if you feel like called out. But, you know, majority of my audience are, aren't even people that like know the two of us. Um, so don't worry. But uh, yeah, I I hate to break it to to you if you're listening. Yeah, that that movie Numb. Yeah, that movie was entirely about you. And if you go back and watch it and you listen to the narration, that's going to be very blatantly obvious. Um, but the thing is, I made this movie before I confessed to him. This movie was about my fear of how things could possibly go, um, because I was a junior and he was a senior, and so the movie was sort of about the fear of like. I mean, he's going to be gone soon. Like, what's the point in confessing my love for him if he's just going to be, like, out of my life just like that? And I made that movie about that, and it's one of the most existential and, like, not to, like, pat myself on the back or anything, but just for me personally, one of the most emotionally cathartic and impactful things that I think I've ever made for sure. And then after we, after he ended things, as I said, I continued to be in shows and uh, he was actually the director of one of the biggest shows that the school did in which I had the lead role. <laughs> so that, uh, yeah, it definitely didn't make that any easier, having to see him, like, every fucking day and having to, like, you know, having to have him direct me and all that stuff. That definitely wasn't easy. Um, and, and bless his heart, he he was so kind about it. He was like, I'm sorry, like, I'm so sorry that, like, like if it hurts that you're going to have to see me every day, like, I really don't want... Th- he genuinely genuinely so sweet and we did try to spend a little bit of time together after ending things just to try to be friends but we have since kind of completely drifted apart we haven't talked in a in a significant way in a very very long time i hope he's doing well if you're listening to this i i hope you're doing well i hope i hope you're happy And I just want everybody to know I am over it. I know hearing me talk about it, it may sound like I'm not, but also keep in mind the only reason I'm actually talking about it as in-depth as I am is because, like, it's part of the point of the episode. You know, it's not like these are things that are on my mind 24-7. I'm I'm over it for sure. As I said, I'm in a very, very happy and healthy long-term committed relationship with my wonderful boyfriend who I love so dearly and who is the genuine true love of my life. So so please don't, uh, don't think that. And you might be thinking, well, Xavier, if you're getting at this point of having to make sacrifices when it comes to love um, in your pursuit of artistic expression, this doesn't really fit that narrative because you didn't really sacrifice it. Like, like he's the one who didn't have feelings and he ended things. That is true. The thing that I sac- that I had to sacrifice in this situation was... <sighs> 
how do I phrase this? I don't want to say my feelings for him because well, another big portion of this film's themes is that me and Sebastian are always going to love each other, and even though they don't end up together, they're always going to have a certain love for each other, and that definitely is the situation here too. I am always going to have a piece of my heart that sits with this person, and that's okay. I think that's healthy. Um, I, I think it's it's good. Obviously, it's not the, the same kind of love as I had at that time. Obviously, that would be problematic, but it is definitely still a very a very genuine not romantic, not platonic love, just sort of this overall existential love and just this appreciation for him as a person and just who he is as a person and just the fact that someone like him exists. What I had to sacrifice here effectively was those feelings for him. If I was going to pull myself out of the hell that I was in and if I was going to get over it, I had to start healthily coping with those feelings, which I didn't for a long time healthily cope with those feelings but as anyone who knows me personally knows it was the art it was always the art i just had to continue writing and continue expressing and getting things off my chest through my art and monotony was about a lot of things and this experience definitely was more so on the back burner but rewatching monotony now i would be lying if i said that i i didn't think that my experience with this guy didn't in some way influence the production because I wrote Monotony long before I had even met him. But just in my direction and certain things that I was directing the actors to do in that film, it definitely worked its way in. And there were a couple late stage rewrites that I think could have possibly been inspired by this experience for sure. I guess more than anything, it, it was really music. And this is uh, one of the biggest things that it helped me grow with, that, that this experience helped me grow with in my growth as an artist is um, because my favorite artist, Conan Gray, I was introduced to Conan Gray by this person, or at least this person is the person who helped me become a fan of him. And all these years later, he is still my favorite artist. By the way, his new album just came out and it's fucking incredible and there's a song on it that is exactly my feelings on this experience. It's called Forever With Me, and it's beautiful, and you should listen to it if you haven't. But yeah, I just had to sacrifice those thoughts of what could have been if I was going to pull myself, as I said, out of this extremely guttural, this hell that I was in for the longest time, that I helped, that I held myself in, for the longest time and so on a romantic level when it comes to making sacrifices for the pursuit of the arts that's what this film uh yeah we're still talking about la la land just in case you forgot <laughs> that's definitely what this film does for me uh in that sense for sure but i would argue that i've made even more sacrifices when it comes to platonic friendships i talked i'm not going to talk about this particular thing um, at length in this episode because I kind of already talked about it sort of at length in my episodes on Whiplash and The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Uh, oddly enough, you, you wouldn't think The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo would warrant that conversation, but it did. So go check out those two episodes if you want to hear more details about it. But let's just say that I definitely know uh, what it's like to sacrifice or I guess having to sacrifice platonic friendships for the sake of being true to an artistic vision and I do have a lot of regrets in that regard and it's a very complex situation as I said go listen to those other episodes if you want to know more about it go and get yourself that context and then come back here and you'll understand why this movie also why I relate to this movie also very much on that level I also feel like this film has a lot to say when it comes to artistic integrity versus commercial success. The film grapples with the tension between artistic integrity and commercial success. As I said, Sebastian's love for traditional jazz clashes with the commercial demands of the music industry, leading him to question whether he should compromise his artistic vision for financial stability. Similarly, Mia faces the challenge of staying true to her craft as an actress while navigating the competitive and often superficial world of Hollywood. And um, again, my experience with um, The Coldest Serving, 
um, definitely is where I relate to the film in that regard, you know, like, it's that battle of having to sacrifice your artistic vision for the betterment of, like, the more business aspects of it, or staying true to your artistic vision so you get the full catharsis of saying exactly what you want to say, exactly how you want to say it. And that's a dilemma that I don't think any artist is really ever going to get over. All we can really do is stick to Taika Waititi's philosophy, which is you do one for them and you do one for you. Um, and, and that's really all I have to say about that. And I do want to say the exploration of Sebastian's desire to stay like stay true to traditional jazz in a world that's trying to force him to sort of assimilate into more contemporary pop oriented styles and remixes of of traditionally jazz oriented music um it, it i don't know it's just it's a very intriguing thing for me i guess where i could relate to that is in my filmmaking i, I really do love a lot of filmmaking techniques in older movies but i also feel like modern day cinema is actually extremely overhated and underappreciated like we have so many revolutionary directors currently working before our very eyes and maybe in time we will realize that they are the new revolutionaries but in current time it's so easy for us to just be like oh they just don't make them like they used to but look la la land is very much a movie that is made for the purposes of this debate like they used to quote unquote it is very much an homage to the musical golden age of Hollywood, you know, films like Singing in the Rain and j just all those, all those great big budget, um, cinemascope, <laughs> uh, and Panavision musicals from that time for sure. But it also does put a, a modern spin on it, having it take place in modern day with this modern day romance and technology and all of that stuff. Damien Chazelle is a very passionate jazz musician, and so he is definitely trying to say something with the character of Seb that I think is very admirable. I actually quite do love jazz music, and obviously Chazelle wrote and directed Whiplash, but it doesn't go much deeper than that for me, just in regards to the very specific, like, niche passion of jazz music. You know, I love jazz music, and I love the skill and the, the improvisation that goes into it for sure, and so I, so I sort of more so relate to it on a surface level rather than the, the more deep and existential level that I relate to it on a... On a, like when it comes to the romantic experience that I just talked about. I also want to point out that despite facing numerous setbacks and obstacles, Mia and Sebastian demonstrate remarkable persistence and resilience in their pursuit of their dreams. I mean, their ability to persevere in the face of adversity really serves as a testament to the power of passion, determination, and the belief in oneself. And that's the message that I, more than anything, I think at this point in my life, want to promote with my content and my art is that if you genuinely are as passionate about it as you say you are, nothing is going to stop you because, as Chris Stuckman said, you're never going to accept anything less from you. If you're genuinely that driven and genuinely that passionate, you you will have the determination and the drive to get there. And it's a long road. And it's a long journey. But when you get there, it is more than worth it. And I haven't even really made it in the sense of like, I'm not a big name at all. Nobody really knows who I am. Um, no one of like industry note, I guess. You know, I haven't won any Oscars. I haven't had my, like, feature directorial debut or anything. But you set milestones for yourself. In competition theater, that was winning Best Actor at MTA, which I did. And um, I won that award in front of potentially thousands of people. And that was insane. <laughs> you know, on an exponentially smaller level, that was like my Oscar moment. And then, of course, getting to write and direct my own original show, which I alluded to earlier, and having people actually like come and see it and seeing my vision brought to life so beautifully, on stage at least. Uh, <laughs> as I said, go listen to those other episodes if you want more context. But regardless, like, the, you set those milestones for yourself and you get there and you realize... Yes, I believed in myself and I had the drive and the determination to get there and I did and I didn't compromise my vision 
and I'm all the more grateful for it. And as cliche as it is, this is why you can never give up. And this is why I don't think you're actually capable of giving up. People like you and me who are who are in these headspaces like 24-7, because as I said, you're never going to accept anything less from you. If you have a dream and you want to achieve it, you can. You legitimately can. And don't let anybody ever tell you that you can't. Don't let them do that. You have it in you. What you have to say matters. If you genuinely have that dream and you are as passionate about it as you say you are, you can do it. There is nothing stopping you. There are things getting in the way, but there is nothing bringing you to a full stop that you can't overcome if you genuinely have that much passion for it. And I think it is so important to never forget that. And now we're going to hit on the theme that I have been kind of avoiding (laughs) for the majority of this episode because it's really the thing that hits deepest for me just in regards to this overall existential discussion around art and growth as a person and as an artist and how art affects me as a person. And that is the passage of time and regret. Here we go. So the passage of time and the theme of regret are explored through the film's non-linear narrative and dreamlike sequences. Mia and Sebastian's imagined, like, alternate realities, to me, serve as a very poignant reflection on the choices they've made and the paths they've taken. The film suggests that while it's natural to wonder what if, Ultimately, we really must come to terms with the choices we've made and find meaning in the journey in the journey, regardless of the outcome. And that just really, really rings true for me because as I and, and a lot of fellow artists likely listening to this will tell you, so much of the pursuit of a career in artistic expression, we can sort of get hung up on recognition and the goals and if we don't get positive feedback or like really any form of recognition for a piece of art that we make it sort of makes us feel a little worthless and makes us feel like our art doesn't have significance and we put so much weight in the outcome of our journey that we many times forget to cherish the journey itself you know, not a crazy amount of people can you know, I mean, it did okay, but not a crazy amount of people came to see my original show that I did. And that really bugged me for a very long time. But the journey of it, as negative as a lot of it was, I learned so much from it. And looking back, I really wish I had cherished the journey of creating that show in the moment much more than I actually did and you know maybe things would have turned out better behind the scenes if I had devoted more time to that for sure but even now this is something that I am still struggling with because honestly guys I it's been a minute since I've I've made another original film or another original play You know, I I do YouTube and I do the podcast and it's an amazing creative medium and it is another form of artistic expression that I obviously participate in. And I do continue to write scripts on the daily, but it's been a long time since I've got got anything off the ground because I've just become so overwhelmed with school and feelings like I'm not good enough. And at the start of this, this year of college... I was back into a very dark place in my life, and and that was another hell that I had to pull myself out of. And it sort of put me in this position where I'm still sort of in the moment struggling to cherish each day as it comes. And instead, I'm just thinking like, man, what if, you know, what if my first day of college, I marched my ass down to play Oscar and was just like, hey, I'm a writer. I have a vision for a show and I would like to put it on. What what if I just did that? What if I took that chance, took that leap? But as I said, we are so naturally predisposed to pondering the what ifs and not the what is. 
And again, it's another very cliched thing, but the importance of living in the moment truly cannot be understated. I think definitely one of the things the film is saying is that if Mia and Sebastian had lived in the moment more, and I'd put more emphasis on living in the moment, maybe things would have worked out, you know? And and it's why that final montage at the end of the movie is so heartbreaking when you see what could have been. A lot of people don't like it because they're like, well, see, the, I mean, they show what could have been, and if that could have been, then they easily could have stayed together and both have achieved their dreams and still stayed together. Like, they didn't have to separate. Respectfully, that's not the fucking point. <laughs> yeah, me and Sebastian were kind of perfect for each other in a lot of ways, but it's not a matter of do or don't. You know, it's not a matter of will they, won't they. It's a matter of could they have. And if they had, what would that have been like? And could they have and why didn't they? You know? Well, I, I think it's very clearly not making the case that they couldn't have ended up together for the purposes of the story. I don't think it's making that case at all. It literally shows us that they could have. That's why it's so heartbreaking. A lot of people feel that it was kind of a cop-out. They're like, oh, they literally just did that just to, like, get people emotional because narratively speaking they could have ended up together so like you literally just had them break up just to make the emotional gut punch no I feel like that's a very shallow reading of the film I think it's not emotionally gut punching because it's it's like a a shocking outcome I think it's an emotional gut punch because they could have ended up together and the the biggest tragedy of the film for me that it's exploring is this concept of worrying too much about what if and not what is. As I've already said several times, you're probably sick of me saying it. I think their relationship ended because of that. I don't think they spent enough time cherishing the journey. They spent so much time purely focused on the outcome. And by the time they realize that, it's just too late. And for me, I feel like that's really what the film is saying about it. And just this more overall theme of the passage of time and regret, just not even solely just from uh, an artistic, um, you know, a pursuit of the artistic of uh, a pursuit of artistic expression perspective, but just on a more so an overall perspective of life. God damn, does that ring so true for me? I mean, the passage of time, as I said, it's one of the things that gets me the most emotional, and it's it's literally the entire thesis of a ghost story, which is why I'm so scared to do an episode on it, because I don't know how I'm going to not only like articulate everything I want to say about it, but also just emotionally keep myself together for an episode about that film. But in the second act of this film, when Mia decides that it's simply too hard and she moves back home, I mean... Damn, is that very close to home, no pun intended for me. I mean, I, I literally did the same thing, you know. I, I was in Ocean Springs my sophomore year, ripe with opportunity, so many great opportunities, but it just got too hard, and I took the easy way out, and I moved back home. And then her love and, and her feelings for Sebastian are what ultimately convince her to go back. And my love and my feelings for the, the friendships that I developed in Ocean Springs are what convinced me to move back to Ocean Springs. So it, it's, I'm, I'm sort of just now in real time realizing <laughs> uh, how similar that actually is to my experience. Wow. But here's the kicker. Her moving back and continuing to take that journey also results in her losing Sebastian. And the, the case could be made that me choosing to move back to Ocean Springs and fulfill my potential and my opportunities that I had there also resulted in me losing pretty much everyone aside from my boyfriend and two or three very close friends that I still have. I lost pretty much everyone through that journey of artistic expression. I lost pretty much everybody that meant everything to me, which is also exactly what happens to me and Sebastian in this film. But five years later, at the end of this film, when they see each other again, and they're able to look at each other and see that they've... Guys, I really try not to get emotional on the podcast. I mean, I, I have before. Um, I, I just... 
I don't particularly um, like it because I'm afraid people are going to think I'm doing it for pity or they're going to think it's fake. But the environment in which I'm recording this, like, as I said, I'm listening to the music on my headphones right now. I my room is in complete dark. I, I put it in complete darkness. I'm just sitting on my bed and I have my my LEDs and my vines and a sunset lamp. I purposely put myself in a very emotionally resonant environment whenever I record these episodes, so I apologize uh, for getting emotional here, but as I said, at the end of this movie, when these two people who loved each other so much and still do in so many ways, so many years later, come across each other again and see that they have both achieved everything that they've ever wanted to achieve, and and on a deeper level, the things that they wanted each other to achieve. Mia wanted Sebastian to achieve his dream, just as Sebastian wanted Mia to achieve her dream. And all these years later, when they cross paths again, and they see that they've both achieved their dreams, and they're able to have that beautiful final moment together, where they just look at each other, and they smile, and... You know, it's like smiling is pleasant, but you can see this this deep-rooted sort of sorrow that I think really speaks to the the fact that they said they are always going to love each other. And there's always going to be a part of them that wonders what could have been. But there's also so much pride in it. They're so You can tell they're so proud of each other. And they couldn't have gotten to where they are without each other. They legitimately couldn't have. I mean, damn. (laughs) I'm so sorry. I, I, you know, sitting down, I was like, no, you know, I've watched this movie so many times. I've talked about it so many times. I've I've gotten my emotions out. I'm not going to get emotional in this episode. But to be honest, this is my first time revisiting it in in a while, relatively speaking. And um, I don't know. There's just so much depth and nuance there and just... God damn it. I just, I've lost a lot of people in my journey of artistic expression. And I just love the catharsis of this scene when they see that they're happy. You know, all these years later, having like not been together and having this moment where they see that they both achieved what they wanted to achieve and that they're happy. And and you just have to assume that in that five-year gap... They likely had many moments individually where they were thinking, you know, where Mia was thinking, you know, I wonder what happened to Sebastian. Like, I wonder, like, like I hope he's happy. I really hope he's happy. And Sebastian doing the same with Mia. Like, I really hope she achieved her dreams of being an actress. I, I hope she's happy. I wonder if she's happy. I really hope so. And as I said, I, I've lost so many people in my pursuit of the arts. And I just, now having matured and grown, just, I can't even have any ill feeling towards anyone. I just really hope. That everyone is happy. The people who I've wronged, the the various people who have wronged me. I just, I don't even want to think about all of that. All I can really think about now is just the love I have for them and the pure intention and the pure thought of just, I just hope they're happy. More than anything, I just, I really just more than anything want the people who I've drifted away from to be happy. And I just, I wish them the best in life. And I just hope that I can have a moment with them. The way that me and Sebastian have in this movie. Where we can look each other in the eyes. And all the bad shit that happened doesn't even matter anymore. And we can just sit there and look at each other and say, We made it. We made it. There are very few things that I, that I hope happen for me more than that. And so this movie really strikes a chord for me. That's really all I have to say about all of that. Guys, I really do appreciate you listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you listen to the whole thing, I commend you. I know it it can be somewhat tedious from time to time. So, And also, as I always say, just anybody who invests any time into my art and my artistic expression I just the the utmost gratitude the utmost thanks to you it genuinely means everything to me I hope you guys have enjoyed this discussion of La La Land and I hope it inspires you to 
think about a lot of the things that I've discussed with it in this episode. I hope maybe if you haven't seen it in a while um, that it inspires you to go back and give it a rewatch thinking about everything I've said and just, you know, seeing if it strikes a chord with you the way it does with me. It's genuinely one of the most impactful films that I've ever seen. And yeah, it's definitely, definitely one of my favorite movies of all time still. And and talking about it in this episode just really brought back all those feelings for me. It's incredible. Um, it, it's genuinely incredible. And if you haven't seen it, you are doing yourself a disservice. You need to watch it. Getting it spoiled for you does not ruin the experience at all. Like, if anything, knowing how it ends only makes the experience of it that much more impactful. Um, it's very, very surprisingly impactful on a rewatch. I do encourage you to rewatch it if you haven't seen it in a while, or again, watch it for a first time if you haven't seen it at all. But yeah, I, I just hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. Please check out all the other episodes if you haven't already. Um, you can check out my YouTube channel where I consistently upload content on various forms of artistic expression, mainly movies at the moment. But, you know, I've started reviewing music as well, which has been really fun. My YouTube channel name is Zaybeast. That is spelled X-A-Y-B-E-A-S-T. That is capital X and no spaces. If you would like to follow my personal and creative endeavors outside of the YouTube channel and the podcast, you can follow me on Instagram at the Xavier Reichbaum. That is at T H E underscore Xavier X A V I E R underscore Reichbaum R E I C H B A U M. Or you can follow the official account for my production company, Headspace Productions, at Headspace Productions on Instagram. No underscores, all lowercase, all one word. So guys, once again, thank you so much for listening. And as always, this has been the Headspace Podcast. Headspace Podcast.